The Lurking Fear, Chapter 1 The Shadow on the Chimney There was a thunder in the air on the night I went to the deserted mansion atop Tempest Mountain to find the lurking fear. I was not alone, for foolhardiness was not then mixed with that love of the grotesque and the terrible which has made my career a series of quests for strange horrors in literature and in life. With me were two faithful and muscular men from whom I had sent as the time came, men long associated with me in my ghastly aspiration because of their peculiar fitness. We had started quietly from the village because of the reports who still lingered about after the eldritch panic of the month before, the nightmare creeping death. Later, I thought, they might aid me, but I did not want them then. Would to God that I had let them in my search, that I might not have had to bear this secret alone for so long, to bear it alone for fear the world would call me mad, or go mad itself, as the demonic implication of the thing. Now that I am telling it anyway, lest the brooding make me a manic, I wish I had never concealed it, for I, and I only, know what manner of fear lurked on the spectral and desolate mountain. In a small motor car, we covered the miles of primeval forest and the hill until the wooded ascent checked it. The country-born aspect more than usually sinister, as viewed it by night and without the accustomed crowds of investigators, so that we were often tempted to use the acetylene headlight, despite the attention that it might attract. It was not a wholesome landscape after dark, and I believed I would have noticed its morbidity even had I been ignorant of the terror that had stalked there. Of wild creatures, there were none. They were wise when death is close. The ancient lightning-scarred trees seemed unnaturally large and twisted, and the other vegetation unnaturally thick and feverish, while curious mounds and hummocks in the weedy, fulgate behind earth reminded me of snakes and dead man's skulls swelled to gigantic proportions. Fear had lurked on Tempest Mountain, for more than a century. This I learned at once from newspaper accounts of the catastrophe which first brought the region to the world's notice. The place is remote, lonely elevation in the part of the Catskills where Dutch civilization once feebly and transiently penetrated, leaving behind as it receded only a few ruined mansions and a degenerate squatter population inhabiting pitiful hamlets on isolated slopes. Normal beings seldom visited the locality till the state police were formed, and even now only infrequent troopers patrol it. The fear, however, is an old tradition throughout the neighboring villages, since it is a prime topic in the simple discourse of the poor Mongols who sometimes leave their valleys to trade their hand-woven baskets for such primitive necessities as they cannot shoot, raise, or make. The lurking fear dwelt in the shunned and deserted Martet's mansion, which crowned the height, but gradual eminence, whose liability to frequent thunderstorm gave it the name of Tempest Mount. For over a hundred years, this antique, grove-circled stone house had been the subject of stories incredibly wild and monstrously hideous. Stories of a silent, colossal, creeping death, which stalked abroad in summer, 
with a whimpering insistence, the squatters told tales of a daemon which seized the lone wayfarers after dark, either carrying them off or leaving them in a frightful state of gnawed dismemberment. While well, sometimes they whispered of blood trails toward the distant mountain. Some said the thunder called the lurking fear out of its inhabitation, while others said that the thunder was its very voice. No one outside the backwoods believed these varying and conflicted stories, with their incoherent, extravagant descriptions of the half-glimpsed fiend. Yet not a farmer or a villager doubted that the Martins' mansion was ghoulishly haunted. Local history forbade such doubt. Although no ghastly evidence was ever found by any such investigators as had ever visited the building, after some especially vivid tales of the squatters, grandmothers told strange myths of the Martin Spectre, myths concerning the Martin's family itself, its queer hereditary dissimilarity of eyes, its long, unnatural annals, and the murder which had cursed it. The terror which brought me to the scene was a sudden and portentous confirmation of the mountaineer's wildest legends. One summer night, after a thunderstorm of unprecedented violence, the countryside was aroused by a squatter stampede which no delusion could create. The pitiful throngs of natives shrieked and whined of that unnameable horror which had descended down upon them, and they were now doubted. They had not seen it, but they had heard such cries from one of their hamlets that they knew the creeping death had come. In the morning, citizens and state troopers followed the shuddering mountaineers to the place where they said the death had come. And death was indeed there. The ground under one of the squatters' villages had caved in after a lightning stroke, destroying several of the malodorous shanties. But upon this property damage was superposed an organic devastation which paled to its insignificance. Of a possible seventy-five natives who had inhabited this spot, not one living specimen was visible. The disordered earth was covered with blood and human debris, speaking too vividly the ravages of demon teeth and talons, yet no visible trail led away from the carnage. That some hideous animal must be the cause, everyone quickly agreed. Nor did any tongue now review the charge that such cryptic deaths formed merely the sword and murders common in these decadent communities. That charge was revived only when about twenty-five of the estimated population were found missing from the dead. And even then it was hard to explain the murder of fifty by only half that number. But the fact remained that on a summer night a bolt had come out of the heavens and left a dead village whose corpses were horribly mangled, chewed, and clawed. The excited countryside immediately connected the horror with the haunted Martins mansion. Though the localities were over three miles apart, the troopers were more than skeptical, including the mansion only casually in their investigations and dropping it altogether when they found it thoroughly deserted. Country and village people, however, canvassed the place with infinite care, overturning everything in the house, sounding ponds and brooks, beating down the bushes, and ransacking the nearby forest. All was in vain. The death that had come had left no trace, save the destruction itself. By the second day of the search, the affair was fully treated by the newspapers, 
whose reporters overran the Tempest Mount. They described it in very much detail, and with many interviews to elucidate the horror's history as told by the local grandmas. I followed the accounts quite languidly at first, for I am a connoisseur of horrors. But after a week, I detected an atmosphere which stirred me oddly, so that on August the 5th of 1921, I registered among those reporters who crowded the hotel and left his corners, the nearest village to Tempest Mountain, and acknowledged headquarters of the searchers. Three weeks more and the dispersal of the reporters left me free to begin my terrible exploration based on the minute inquiries and surveying which I had meanwhile busied myself. So on this summer night, while distant thunder rumbled, I left a silent motor car and tramped with two armed companions up the last mound-covered reaches of Tempest Mountain. Casting the beams of an electric torch on the spectral gay walls that began to appear through the giant oak's head. In this morbid night solitude and feeble shifting illumination, the vast box like pile displayed obscure hints of terror which they would not uncover. Yet I did not hesitate, since I had come with a fierce resolution. To test my idea. I believe that the thunder called the death demon out of some fearsome secret place, and be that demon, solid entity, or vaporous pencilist, I meant to see it. I had thoroughly searched the room before, hence I knew my plan well, choosing as the seat of my vigil the old room of Jan Martins, whose murder looms so great in those rural legends. I felt suddenly that the apartment of this ancient victim was best for my purposes. The chamber, measuring about twenty feet square, contained, like the other rooms, some rubbish, which had once been furniture. It lay upon the second story, on the southeast corner of the home, and in an immense east window and a narrow south window, both devoid of any panes or shutters. Opposite the large window was an enormous Dutch fireplace, with scriptural tiles representing the prodigal son, and opposite the narrow window was a spacious bed built into the very wall. As the tree-muffled thunder slowly grew louder, I arranged my plan's details. First, I fastened side by side to the ledge of the large window three rope ladders, which I had brought with me. I knew they reached a suitable spot upon the grass outside, for I had before tested them. Then the three of us dragged from another room a wide four-poster bedstead, crowding it laterally against the window. Having strewn it with fur burls, all now rested on it with drawn automatics, two relaxing while the third watched. From whatever direction the demon might come, our potential escape was provided. If it came from within the house, we had the window and ladders. If from outside, the door and the stairs, we did not think, judging from precedent, that it would pursue us far, even at our worst. I watched from midnight to one o'clock, when, in spite of the sinister house, the unprotected window, and the approaching thunder and lightning, I suddenly felt singularly drowsy. I was between my two companions, a George Bennett being toward the window, and a William Toby toward the fireplace. Bennett was already asleep, having apparently felt the same anomalous drowsiness which affected me. So I designated Toby for the next watch, although even he was beginning to nod. It was curiously how intently I had been watching that fireplace. The increasing thunder must have affected my dreams. For in that brief moment that I slept, there came to me 
apocalyptic visions. Once I partly awaked, probably because the sleeper toward the window had restlessly flung an arm across my chest. I was not sufficiently awake to see whether Toby was attending to his duties as sentient, but felt the distant anxiety on that score. Never before had the presence of evil so prognantly oppressed upon me. Later I must have dropped asleep again, for it was out of a phantasmal chaos that my mind leapt when the night grew hideous with shrieks beyond anything in any of my former explorations or in my darkest imaginations. In that shrieking, the inmost soul of human fear and agony clawed hopelessly and insanely at the ebony gates of oblivion. I awoke to red madness and the mockery of diabolism. As further and further down inconceivable vistas, that phobic and crystalline anguish retreated and reverberated. There was no light, but I knew from the empty space in my right that Toby was gone. God alone knew whither, and across my chest still lay the heavy arm of the sleeper to my left. Then came that devastating stroke of lightning, which struck the whole mountain and lit the darkest crypts of that hoary grove, splintering the patriarch of those twisted trees. In that demon flash of a monstrous fireball, the sleeper started up suddenly, while the glare from beyond the window threw his shadow vividly upon the chimney, above the fireplace from which my eyes never strayed. That I am still alive, or that I am sane, is a marvel that I cannot fathom. I cannot fathom it, for the shadow on that chimney was not that of George Bennett, or of any other human creature, but of blasphemous abnormality from hell's nethermost craters. It was nameless. It was truly shapeless, an abomination which my mind could not fully grasp, and no pen ever held by man could describe. In another second, I was alone in that accursed mansion, shivering and gibbering. George Bennett and William Toby, of them there was no trace, not even of a struggle, and I never heard of them again. Chapter 2 A Passer in the Storm For days after that hideous experience in the four swathed mansion, I lay nervously exhausted in my hotel room at Lafette's Corner. I do not remember exactly how I managed to reach the motor car, or to start it, or how I slipped unobserved back to the village proper, for I retain no distinct impression save of the wild arm tightened trees, the mutterings of thunder, and a Carninian shadow athwit the low mounds that dotted and streaked the region. As I shivered and brooded on the casting of that brain-blasting shadow, I knew that I had last pried out one of Earth's supreme horrors, one of those nameless blights of those outer voids whose faint demon scratchings we sometimes hear upon the farthest rim of our space, yet from which our own finite vision was given us a merciful immunity. That shadow I had seen, I hardly dared to try to analyze or even dare identify. Something had laid between me and the window that night, but I shuddered whenever I could not cast off the instinct to classify it. If it had only snarled, or bayed, or laughed, even that would have relieved that abysmal, silent hideousness. But it was silent. It had rested a heavy arm or foreleg upon my chest. Obviously it had been organic, or had once been organic. Jan Martins, whose room I had invaded, was buried in the graveyard near the mansion. I must try to find Bennett and Toby, if they indeed lived. Why had it picked them, 
and left me for the last. Drowsiness is very stippling, and my dreams are so horrible. In a short time, I realized that I must tell my story to someone, or indeed, let the madness break me down completely. I had already decided not to abandon the quest of the lurking fear, for in my rash ignorance it seemed to me that uncertainty was worse than enlightenment, however terrible the latter might prove to be. Accordingly, I resolved in my mind the best course to pursue, whom to select for my confidences, and how to track down this thing which had obliterated two men and cast a nightmare's shadow upon my mind. My chief acquaintance at Lafayette's Corner had been the affable reporters, of whom a few still remained to collect the final echoes of the tragedy. It was from these that I determined to choose a colleague, and the more I reflected, the more my preference inclined toward one Arthur Munro, a dark lead man of about thirty-five, whose education, taste, intellect, and temperament seemed to mark him as one not bound to the conventional ideas and experiences of its mortal kin. On an afternoon in early September, Arthur Monroe listened to my story. I saw from the beginning that he was both interested and indeed sympathetic, and when I had finished, he analyzed and discussed the thing with the greatest shrewdness and judgment. His advice, moreover, was eminently practical, for he recommended a postponement of operations in the Martins' mansion until we might become fortified with a more detailed historical and geographical data. On his initiative, we combed the countryside for the more information regarding this terrible Martins' family and discovered a man who possessed a marvelously illuminating ancestral diary. We also talked at length with such of the mountain mongrels as had not fled from the terror and confusion to the remoter slopes, and arranged to proceed our culminating task. The exhaustive and definitive examination of the mansion in the light of its detailed history, with an equally exhaustive and definitive examination of the spots associated with the various tragedies of the squatter legend. The results of this examination were not at first very enlightening, though our tabulation of them seemed to reveal a fairly significant trend, namely that the number of reported horrors was by far the greatest in areas either comparatively near the avoided house or connected with it by stretches of the morbidly overnourished forest. There were, it is true, exceptions. Indeed, the Thor or which had caught the world's ear had happened in a treeless space, remote alike from the mansion and from any of the connected woods. As to the nature and appearance of the lurking fear, nothing could be gained from the scared and witless shanty dwellers. In the same breath, they called it a snake, a giant, a thunder devil, a bat, a vulture, or a walking tree man. We did, however, deem ourselves justified in assuming that it was a living organism, highly susceptible to the electrical storms. And although certain of the stories suggested wings, we believed that its aversion for open spaces made land locomotive a more probable theory. The only thing really incompatible with the latter view was the rapidity in which the creature must have travelled in order to perform all the many deeds attuned to it. When we came to know the squatters better, we found them curiously likable in many ways. Simple animals, though they were, gently descending the evolutionary scale because of their unfortunate ancestry and solidifying isolation. They feared outsiders, but slowly grew accustomed to us. Finally, helping vastly, when we beat down all the thickets and tore out all the petitions of the mansion in our search for the lurking fear. When we asked them to help us find Bennett and Toby, they were truly distressed. They wanted to help us, yet knew that these victims had gone as wholly out of the world as their own missing people. That great numbers of them had actually been killed and removed just as the wild animals had long been exterminated. We were, of course, thoroughly convinced, 
and we waited apprehensively for further tragedies to occur. By the middle of October, we were puzzled by our lack of progress. Owing to the clear nights, no demonic aggression had taken place, and the completeness of our vain searches of house and country almost drove us to regard the lurking fear as a non-material agency. We feared that the cold weather would come on and halt our explorations, for all agreed that the demon was generally quiet in winter. Thus there was a kind of haste and a desperation in our last daylight canvases of the whore-vested hamlet, a hamlet now deserted because of the squatter's deep fears. The ill-fated squatter hamlet had borne no name, but had long ago stood in a sheltered, though treeless, cleft between two elevations called respectively Cone Mountain and Maple Hill. It was closer to Maple Hill than to the Cone Mount, some of the crude abodes indeed being dugouts on the side of the former eminence. Geographically, it lay about two miles northwest of the base of Tempest Mountain, and three miles from the Oak Girt Mansion. Of the distance between the hamlet and the mansion, fully two miles and a quarter on the hamlet side was entirely open country. The plan being of fairly level character, save for some of the low-level snaking mounds, and having as vegetation only the grass and scattered weeds of the wilds. Considering this topography, we had finally concluded that the demon must have come by way of Cone Mountain, a wooden southern proglation of which ran to within a short distance of the westernmost spur of Tempest Mount. The upheaval of ground we traced conclusively to a landslide from Maple Hill, a tall, lone, splintered tree on whose side had been the striking point of the thunderbolt which had summoned the fiend. As for the twentieth time or more, Arthur Monroe and I went minutely over every inch of this violated village. We were filled with certain discouragement, coupled with a vague and novel fear. It was acutely uncanny, even when frightened and uncanny things were indeed becoming common, to encounter so blankly, clueless, a scene after which such overwhelming occurrences... We moved about beneath the leaden, darkened sky with the tragic directionless zeal which results from a combined sense of futility and a necessity of action. Our care was gravely minute. Every cottage was again entered, every hillside dug out, again searched for bodies, and every thorny foot of adjacent slope again scanned for any dens or caves. All of this without result. And yet, as I said, vague new fears hovered menacingly over us. If a giant bat-winged griffin squatted visibly on the mountain top and leered with its abandon eyes, that it looked on transcosmic gulfs. As the afternoon advanced, it became increasingly difficult to see. We heard the rumble of a thunderstorm gather over a tempest mount. The sound in which a locality naturally stirred us though less than it would have done at night. As it was, we hoped desperately that the storm would last until well after dark, and with that hope, turned from our aimless hillside, searching toward the nearest inhabited hamlet to gather a body of squatters as helpers in the investigation. Timid as they were, a few of the younger men were sufficiently inspired by our protective leadership to promise such help. We had hardly more than turned, however, when there descended such a blinding sheet of torrential rain that shelter became imperative. The extreme, almost nocturnal darkness of the sky caused us to stumble sadly, but guided by the frequent flashes of lightning and by our minute knowledge of the hamlet, we soon reached the least porous cabin of the lot, a heterogeneous combination of logs and boards whose still existing door and single tiny window both faced Maple Hill. Barring the door after us against the fury of the wind and rains, we put in place the crude window shutter with our frequent searches as taught us where to find. It was a dismal sitting there 
on the rickety boxes in that pitch darkness, but we smoked our pipes and occasionally flashed our pocket lamps about. Now and then we could see the lightning through the cracks in the wall. The afternoon was so incredibly dark that each flash was extremely vivid. The stormy vigil reminded me shuddingly of my ghastly night upon Tempest Mount. My mind turned to that odd question which had kept reoccurring ever since that nightmarish thing had happened. And again, I wondered why the demon, approaching the three watchers, either from the window or the interior, had began with the men on either side and left the middleman to the last. When the titan fireball had indeed and hopefully scared it away, why had it not taken its victims in some natural order, with myself second, from whichever direction that it had approached? With what manner of far-reaching tentacles did it pray? Or did it know that I was the leader, and it saved me for a fate far worse than that of my companions? In the midst of all these deep reflections, as if dramatically arranged to intensify them, there fell nearby a terrific bolt of lightning, followed by the sound of sliding earth. At the same time, that wolfish wind rose to a demonic crescendo of ululation. We were sure that the lone tree on Maple Hill had indeed been struck again, and Monroe rose from his box and went to the tiny window to ascertain what damage. When he took down the shutter, the wind and rain howled deafeningly inside, so they could not hear what he had said. But I waited while he leaned out and tried to fathom nature's own pandemonium. Gradually a calming of the wind and dispersal of the unusual darkness told me of the storms blowing it out. I had hoped it would last into the night to help our quest. But a fugitive sunbeam from a knothole behind me removed the likelihood of such a thing, suggesting to Monroe that we had better get some light, even if the more showers came. I unbarred and I opened the crude door. The ground outside was a singular mass of muddy pools, with fresh heaps of earth from the slight landslide. But I saw nothing to justify the interest which kept my companion silently leaning out the window. I crossed to where he leaned, and I touched his shoulder, but he did not move. Then, as I playfully shook him and turned him around, I felt the strangling tendrils of a cancerous horror, whose roots reached into the elliptical pasts and fathomless abysses of the night that broods beyond time. Arthur Monroe was dead and on what remained of his chewed and gouged head, there was no longer a face. Sorry for the delay in the readings. You can skip this part if you just want to continue with the stories. Uh, as you can tell, I've lost my voice. I had a horrible flu over Christmas season. Hence, why the massive break in books. Um... I still have a mass amount of phlegm, but I feel much better. Uh, so I'm going to wait till my voice comes back. Then I'm going to finish Dracula. Till then, we'll get some shorter stories. H.P. Lovecraft. Maybe some... I'm going to try, maybe try to stick to scary stories because the rough voice ends to the air of ominity. Uh, anyways, hope you all had a lovely, lovely Christmas and New Year's. Welcome to 2024. Here's to more and ever wonderful stories from Hitchcock Handyman. Thank you, and you have a wonderful and blessed day.